Lord God, we, without you we can do nothing. That's what you said, Lord. You told your disciples, without me you can do nothing. And Lord, I know what that means. Nothing of substance, nothing of real eternal value, Lord. And no matter how much wisdom we think we have, no matter how much knowledge we think we have, no matter how much, uh, Lord, we think we're anointed. Bottom line, Lord, you have to move. You have to touch. And in the end, it's all yours. It's all done by you. Father, we thank you for this, Lord. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise be to God. There's an old song there by Ken Henry in the end there, Spirit Touch Your Church. Boy, do we ever need that. Somebody say amen. You know, there's a there's a few passages that I want to look at this morning and share some things with you that I think is important. Um, you know, one of the big problems in the body of Christ, and it has been for centuries, is that we can't stay in the road. We can't. We get in this ditch over here, or we get in this ditch over here. We go too far this way or too far that way. Um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about leadership this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about the gifts. And when I talk about the leadership gifts, I'm talking about, you know, people that God has called to be leaders in the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, elders, deacons. Um, because in the sense of, you know, we, we've got one of two extremes in the body of Christ. And I've watched it for years. We've got the group over here in this ditch on this side that doesn't respect or honor leaders and elders and those that are called or have gifts and uh, that are older and have more experience or more wisdom. And so you've got this group over here that they just pretty much reject leadership. There's a lot of people that just rejected uh, leadership. They've gone... They, they've gone aside and don't even attend a church. They don't even have a pastor. They don't have uh, uh, any spiritual fathers or spiritual mothers in their lives. They just kind of an island unto themselves. And, 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 and I understand because there's a lot of junk out there and there's a lot of counterfeits, a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing, a lot of people who are abusing their authority and things of that nature. So, but you got that ditch. Okay? Then you've got the other ditch on the other side. The other ditch is that any man or woman of God that's used of God to do anything gets exalted above measure. Almost to the point of being worshipped. Um, you know, I saw that in the Brownsville Revival. Um, where God was moving so powerfully through Steve Hill, through John Kilpatrick, through Dr. Brown, through... Dick Rubin and some of the other guys and, and women that were being used in the revival in a powerful way. And you saw people literally chasing them around um, every night. And um, almost like to the point of they were, you know, more holy than everybody else and could do no wrong. And, you know, and, and, and I've, I've watched this. I mean... If you're going to be in the ministry at all, in any regard of leadership, you're going to face the two extremes. There are going to be people that love you probably uh, and, and lift you up and love you more than you ought to be. Not that you shouldn't be honored and respected if you're a leader, but there are going to be people that, that, that push that too far. I mean, I got somebody right now, you know. And, and when you're when you're a minister, you know you like to hear the nice things because you hear the bad things plenty. You hear, you know, because you got the two extremes. You got those people that that love you, thank you, hung the moon, and you got these people that hate your guts and wish you would die. I mean, you really have both people, right? Both extremes. Um, and Paul, the apostle Paul, wrestled with this. He wrestled with this and tried to explain. 
that we need to be balanced. I guess what I'm saying today is it doesn't matter what you see in a man or woman of God's life, no matter, no matter what great revelation they might have, no matter what great wisdom they might have, no matter what great miracles might Jesus might work through them or what gifts they have, you still have to be careful to focus yourself on Jesus and focus yourself on the truth and on the message more than the messenger. Amen? God's going to use... Look, I look at the, the, the story of Solomon. It, it, it's probably one of the most revealing stories in the Bible of the vanity of men, of the emptiness. Because God appears to Solomon. First of all, God picks Solomon to be the next king to, to follow David, King David, one of his sons. David had many sons. Could have picked any of them. But God picked Solomon, the son of, the, of Bathsheba that he had an affair with. Doesn't sound like something God would do, does it? But yet, that's how he is. He doesn't always pick the most holy, the most righteous, or what looks the most holy and most righteous in the in the eyes of men and women, God knows what He's doing. But He picks Solomon. And then Solomon becomes king, and David has given him instructions on how to build the, the temple. David has seen the entire layout and blueprint from heaven. God revealed it to him. Then David also saved up all the, the finances to build the temple. All Solomon had to do was do it when it was time because God said he wouldn't let David do it because David's hand had blood on him because he'd been a warrior. So he said, a man with blood on his hands is not building my temple. Right? So Solomon builds it. And then Solomon builds his own house. And then Solomon goes and he prays and God appears to him. Now think about this, you guys. God appears to Solomon... Two times. But when Solomon was young, he prayed this prayer. He prayed for wisdom and discernment. He didn't pray for his enemies to be crushed under his feet. He didn't pray for finances and wealth. And everybody knows this story. And God comes to him and says, because you've asked this thing, you've asked for wisdom and discernment above everything else to be able to judge correctly between my people and to do right. Because you didn't ask for your enemies to be subdued under your feet and you didn't ask for riches, I'm going to give you all of it. And the Bible says that God gave Solomon more wisdom, more understanding, more revelation and understanding of spiritual matters and earthly matters than any man that would ever live until God Himself would become flesh and become a man. This is, this is beyond... Our comprehension. And, and, and Solomon described it. He said, I had a great experience of wisdom. I mean, God just opened His spirit and His soul, His being up and filled Him with supernatural understanding, wisdom, and revelation. More than me, more than you, more than anyone. Think about that. Jesus even said it. He said the queen of the south, speaking of the queen of she, queen Sheba, said so she came from far distance to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Solomon wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. We have these in our Bible. They are part of the Holy Bible. Part of the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of Almighty God. Yet this man did not finish the race. He made statements and, and he made statements about, you know, Ecclesiastes. What's, what's beautiful about Ecclesiastes is the raw honesty of a man who knew God, walked with God, had great wisdom and revelation and understanding of all spiritual matters, 
and earthly matters and human matters, but yet wrestled and, 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 and admitted how he wrestled with discouragement, depression, realizing how much of, of, of obtaining all these things ultimately was vanity, he said, emptiness. It's, it's really mind-boggling that the man that God gave the greatest amount of wisdom in the world ended up not using it. I mean, we know the rest of the story about Solomon. That he knew God's Word. He probably knew God's Word as good as his father David did or maybe even better. But he knew God's Word about not multiplying wives to himself, not multiplying silver and gold to himself, not doing all these things, but, but he began to disobey the Scriptures, the Word of God. Even though he would preach, he called himself the preacher. I'm going to read it in a second. He called himself the preacher who laid down many proverbs and many much wisdom for men to live by, men and women to, to follow and obey. And it was inspired by God. It is part of God's Word. And yet Solomon himself could not control his lust, could not, I mean, 300 wives and 700 concubines? Can somebody say, Houston, we have a problem? Right? Then the Bible tells us that he let his wives, and he took many pagan heathen wives as well, and he let those pagan heathen wives, it says, turn his heart away from the Lord. And he turned to idols, to worshiping idols. Did he ever leave worshiping God? No. He believed in God Almighty, Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of his father David. Did he ever quit believing in Him? No. He never quit believing in God because God had revealed Himself to him. But his heart turned away to idols so he added idols, idol worship in with his worship of Jehovah. Then he began to build temples for pagan demon gods for, to satisfy his wives. And then he began to go into those places, those temples, deep pagan temples and worship with his, with his wives. What should this teach us? This should teach us several things. Really, it should teach us. Number one, no one, no matter how much revelation you get from God, no matter how much wisdom, no matter how many visions, no matter how many dreams, no matter how many gifts of the Spirit work through you, no matter how much anointing you flow in, no matter how many sermons you preach, no matter how many people you've led to the Lord, no matter how many people you've, you've laid hands on and been healed in the name of Jesus, no matter what, you are still capable of falling away completely. Screwing it up royally. You know, that's where we get the Scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 12 and 13 there, but verse 12 in particular when he says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So we should learn, number one, is no one's immune. So if no one's immune, it doesn't matter how much they're gifted, whether they're an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist or a pastor, a teacher, an elder, a deacon, Sunday school teacher, theologian, multiple degrees on the wall in theology. It doesn't matter. Because any person can get into error, can get into sin, can fall, can get into idolatry, can screw it up royally. But now here's something that here, here, here's the other side of this picture. See, we got a lot of people right now who think they've got it all together out there in the world. I hate to say this. I mean, this is younger believers. I was like this too in the in my twenties. I thought I had it all together. 
Because I could, I could read the Scripture and I could see what was wrong in the church world. And I thought I had it all right. Well, you live a little bit. You live a little while. And you find out just having it all right in your head doesn't mean it's all going to work out. Doesn't mean you're going to be able to do it any better than anybody else. You get what I'm saying? I know I'm going. I know y'all, y'all might be having a hard time, but I'm trying to go somewhere with this because we look at Solomon now, and there, there were some people if they were looking at a, at a at a modern situation. Like I mean, we we can use Jimmy Swaggart. I've used him before. Jimmy Swaggart had two very visible moral failures that took his ministry down from one of the top ministries in the world down to the ground. Crash, burn, right? But Jimmy Swaggart had preached a lot of great sermons, a lot of great messages. God had used him to lead a lot of people to Jesus. A lot of people. Now granted, his fall brought shame, it brought reproach upon the church world, upon him and his family. It was a painful situation and and pretty much put a dent in and a big dent in him being able to continue the way he had. But what I'm getting at is it didn't negate the message he preached. It didn't negate the souls that were saved for all eternity, the lives that were changed. That Jesus and the cross was exalted. That repentance was preached. That many people came to faith. Many were healed. Many were baptized in the Holy Spirit. See, if we, if we look at men too much, if we thought it was all about men, then why, we should just throw out the books of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs and Song of Solomon because Solomon screwed it up in the end. Right? But God is not that way. You know who's always fascinated me out of the apostles is Peter. (laughs) Hear what I'm about to tell you. This is for somebody today. I don't know. Maybe somebody here, maybe somebody's listening. But this is for somebody today. Peter has always intrigued me. Peter was passionate. He was very passionate about Jesus. He was passionate about the ministry. He was passionate to do what God wanted him to do. But he was also (laughs) flawed. Right? And this is what I love. I picked up the Bible. I want everybody to just turn with me to, to Mark chapter 9 for a second I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit direct this today because I opened the Bible last night in church and this just leaped off the page at me so it's for somebody but it does go with what I'm preaching to you today Mark chapter I'm sorry, did I say chapter 9? I meant chapter 8 and 9. We'll look at chapter 8 first. But this is verse 27. Now this is as when Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. By the way, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and other one of the prophets. And he said, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Of course, in Matthew 16... Jesus goes on to say, Blessed are you, Simon, because flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. So, here's Simon Peter with Jesus and the, and the Father, God Almighty, by His Spirit is giving Peter supernatural revelation that he is looking at the, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. 
And Jesus notices this and He says, Wow, Simon, flesh and blood didn't tell you this. Your brain didn't tell you. Your body didn't tell you this. Your soul and emotions didn't tell you this. My Father in Heaven revealed this to you supernaturally. And then, let's keep reading. Verse 31, And He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And He spake that saying openly. And Peter took Him and began to rebuke Him. But when He had turned about, He looked on His disciples and He rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind Me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So he's, he, one minute, Peter's flowing in the Holy Ghost, speaking an inspired prophetic revelation. And the next minute, he's letting the devil talk through him. Anybody ever felt that kind of spiritual schizophrenia? Listen, this is us. I don't care who you are. I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't care what you're called to do. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how much revelation, understanding, wisdom, anointing, power. I don't care how many signs and wonders you've done. You are a spiritual schizophrenic. Every true born again Christian, it's Peter right here. You say, well, the other apostles didn't. Oh, they did worse, some of them. Can you imagine going to the Last Supper, walking with behind Jesus, going to the Last Supper, and, 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 and all of them arguing who's going to be the greatest? Some people said Peter won that argument. That's why he ended up denying Jesus. But can you imagine? That's us! The, the, these were not the crowd following Jesus. The fickle crowd. These were not even the 70 following Jesus. This was the 12. And we look at another place and we find that Peter, James, and John did the same thing. And we're not even talking about Judas here. We're talking about the three pillars. So I'm reading this. I'm reading this, and of course Jesus goes on to say, and I'm not going to leave this out, this is important. Verse 34, right after He rebukes Peter and calls him Satan. And when He had called the people unto Him with His disciples also, He said to them, Whosoever will come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for My sake and the Gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Or whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him shall I also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I'm reading this last night just before the service started, and I look down. Let's skip down into chapter nine, verse two. So uh, six days later, we're talking about within a week. The same week. It says, And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain, apart, by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his raiment, or his clothing, became shining, exceedingly white as snow, as no fuller on earth can whiten them. And there appeared Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said, Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Uh, Peter had a talking problem. Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid or amazed. And there was a cloud that was overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more save Jesus only with themselves, and they came down from the mountain, and he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man was risen from the dead. And they kept saying to themselves, questioning one another, what the rising of the dead should mean. So when I was reading this last night, of course I looked and saw where Peter 
One minute he's flowing in the Holy Spirit because God has called him. Everybody look at me. God calls and God anoints flawed and imperfect people. Our problem is when we try to make them something they cannot be. You hear what I'm saying? I can tell you this right now. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We may turn there in a second, but I'll just give you the chapter. Solomon makes this statement. Very simple. He said, there's no man that sinneth not. Right? Paul said, don't make me out to be something I'm not. Paul even called himself the chief of sinners. Okay? Now, don't anybody take wrong what I'm saying here because I'm not saying that a man or woman of God or any Christian or any leader should just blatantly, willfully live in sin, indulge sin and rebellion and their lust and their all that. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? I know some people might try to twist this and take it that way. It's not what I'm saying. But then we got people on the other side of the ditch and I know some of them that actually say that if you're born again Christian, you will never sin. I don't know where they're getting that from. What it does say in 1 John chapter 3, it does say, He that is born of God sinneth not, but you have to look up the Greek verb tenses to understand that that means will not practice a sin. Will not live in a lifestyle of it. Right? And we've talked about that here at Fire and Grace Church quite a bit. Preached on it, talked about it. I think we all understand that, but I do say that because we have new people listening all the time. Okay? That's why I wrote the book Grace Abuse to define the difference between a Christian who struggles sometimes and sins versus a Christian who has just decided they're going to live in it, indulge it, do whatever they want, and think they're going to be okay with God in the end. That's not it at all. Because see, what am I getting at today? I'm getting at this. We're going to go back to this scripture, but I'm getting at this point. No matter where you are in the body of Christ, leadership or not, no matter how many gifts, no matter how much wisdom, no matter how much understanding you have, no matter how much knowledge you think you have, no matter how much you think you might have it right at the moment, there will never be a time. Never. You hear what I'm saying? There will never be a time. And God's made it this way. There will never be a time that you do not need the blood of Jesus Christ. There will never be a time that you do not need the grace and power and help of the Spirit of God to live this life and do what you need to do. God has made us this. The, the, the creature is subjected to this weakness. You hear me? Should you, you should endeavor to live as holy and righteous and obedient to God as you possibly can. But don't ever think that this pastor says that you're going to reach some state of perfection or you're going to reach some state of where, where you never do anything wrong or sin or struggle or could fall. No, we're all frail and vulnerable. And this is why we should always remember when we see a brother or sister do something that's wrong, we should always remember before we say anything. It's not wrong to say something. It's not wrong to bring correction. It's not wrong to bring instruction. It's not wrong to bring rebuke. But before we do that, we should always remember that we do the same thing sometimes. So that's why it should always come forth with as much gentleness and compassion as we can because anything where we might accuse someone else of or rebuke or correct someone else of, even if we're not doing it at that moment, we have the potential that we can. This is why we need to be gentle. And you know, honestly, I can say I haven't always been as gentle as I should be. Or compassionate or kind. I'm learning. 
God's letting me get beat in the head sometimes by the devil to remind me. Be gentle. Be compassionate. Understand people people are screwing up and we never want to we never want to see people or, or make people feel like there is no hope for them. I don't care how bad you screw it up. How bad you fall, how bad you sin, how bad you mess it up. All you got to do is not quit. Don't give up. Don't decide to live there. Don't decide to just make your camp there. You hear what I'm saying? I thank God that when my world fell apart, and I went through my period of the darkness beyond darkness, when I became a lukewarm, I thought I'd never become what I used to preach against. And I became a lukewarm Christian, and I didn't want to go to church anymore, and I didn't even want to be around Christians. Now here are you talking about it with somebody who pastored a church, who pastored multiple churches, youth pastor, singles pastor, evangelist, teacher, author of a book, missionary, preached to thousands. Was at a point in my life I didn't want to even go in the door of a church. I didn't want to be around Christians. I told the Lord I didn't care if I ever preach again. And all that hurt and all that pain and all that bitterness made me a, a person that was, that was getting in danger of going to hell. But one thing I refused to do is give up. Because I would still pray, God, I don't want to be this way. I don't want to. I had unforgiveness in my heart toward those that hurt me. I had bitterness in my heart. I had anger. I had confusion. I had just, just torment. Depression, discouragement for everything that happened that went wrong. Didn't want to preach. Didn't want to teach. Even though God called me to do it. Didn't want to do it anymore. I actually, at that point, was just like, God, I don't care if I live another day. Only reason I even cared about living another day at that moment because I was so down and so depressed and so discouraged. The only reason I, I cared about living another day is because I had two little girls at the time that needed daddy to somehow pull it together. Now see, the difference is, you know what? I was going through the same stuff that a lot of unsaved people go through. Remember the storm comes to the just and the unjust. Well, the storm came to my life. The only reason I'm still here, the only reason I made it out of that dark pit because I refused to completely give up and go back to the world. I said, Jesus, I know I have unforgiveness in my heart. Help me forgive. Jesus, I know my heart's broken. Please heal it and fix it. Jesus, I know you've called me to preach and eventually I'll have to do it again, but I, I, have, I don't have it now. And I refuse to let go. Jesus, I'm not going to live. I'm not going to go back and live and see. I don't want to die and go to hell. I know the truth. See, what I clung to was I knew, I, all, I knew, I, I knew several things that were unmovable. Jesus was real. The cross, He died for me. He rose from the dead. He loved me. He wanted me, He wanted me to make it. I knew that believers, as well as unsaved unbelievers, we're going to go through dark, difficult times in our lives. People are going to hurt us, do us wrong. We're going to fail. We're going to fall down. We're going to screw it up royally. Make bad decisions. Sin. Hurt other people. So I knew bad things could happen to people who were even trying to live for God. So I knew that truth. 
I also knew and believed and never, never has been shaken, never will be shaken, that God's Word is true. And I would always say, God, I know Your Word is true. Therefore, I refuse to let go. I don't know how many times I would say there's nowhere else for me to go, but I don't, I don't want to be around those mean Christians anymore. God has to, had to deal with all that. And, and you guys know the rest of the story. God began to show me. He helped me forgive the people who hurt me severely. You're always going to have Judas in your life. Listen, there, there's no walk with real walk with Jesus until there's a Judas. Until you've been betrayed and broken. And so what am I getting at? You got to refuse to let go. See, I'm, I'm going back to this story here. I was reading this story, and I read, I read how Peter, Jesus called him out, and said he was a stone, he was a piece of the rock. I mean, think about that. that that's basically Jesus saying, "You're you're like me. You're a part of me." You're a chip off the old block here. You're, 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 you're my son. You're my, you know, Jesus loved him. Jesus called him. Jesus anointed him. Jesus was trying to teach him how to be a leader. Right? But I look at Jesus. Listen to me, everybody. This, this, is, this is what's amazing about God. Jesus knew when he called Peter, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He knew Peter had issues when he called him. He knew he would have issues <laughs> after he got saved, after he got baptized in the Holy Ghost, after he healed the sick. He knew. And that's why I was reading this story. I read this and I said, look at Jesus right here. Peter flows in the Holy Spirit. You're the, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not, you know, an hour or two later, later on that day, He's letting Satan talk through him and Jesus is having to rebuke him and call him Satan. Yet, Jesus takes who up to the Mount of Transfiguration? Peter, James, and John. He also took Peter up there knowing that very soon, shortly thereafter, Peter was going to deny him three times. That he even knew him and curse in the process of denying Think about that. Can I say this? When God drew you to the faith of Jesus Christ, when He drew you to the cross, no man can come to Jesus unless the Father draws Him. When God began to draw you, He knew and still knows Every time you were going to blow it. He knows it. And yet, He will keep calling you. What did He do? I love this. Here, Peter let Satan talk through him. So, he screwed up before the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus knows He's going to screw up after this. Yet, He takes Peter up on the mountain is transfigured. The glory comes on Jesus. He's shining bright light. So bright that it's just blinding. Moses and Elijah are standing there talking to Jesus. And the glory of God comes. The cloud and the glory of the presence of Almighty God comes and hovers over them and speaks to them just like with Moses on the mountain. He says, this is my son, my beloved son, hear him. Can you imagine? This experience is given to a man who just blew it and who's going to blow it again.
You know why? I'm going to tell you why. Because I believe Jesus knew I have here a man with his flaws, with his passion that's good one minute and bad the next, with his blabbering mouth. I have a man though here that's made up his mind. He's coming after me. No matter if he trips, no matter if he falls, no matter if he stumbles, no matter what, he's coming after me and he's not going to, he's going to get up, dust himself off, and keep running. Can I say that's what God is looking for in, in every believer? Don't give up. Don't back up. If you fall down, if you mess up, if you sin, if you, your mouth, the devil uses your mouth and talks through you. If you go through a period where you're angry or you have unforgiveness or you hurt or you, or you fall into lust or whatever, you got a decision right then. Give up and go live in whatever it is. Dwell in it. Dwell in bitterness. Dwell in unforgiveness. Dwell in lust and sexual perversion or whatever. Dwell in it or get up. And say, Jesus, wash me, forgive me, help me, I'm clean me off, clean my, my scraped knee, put the band-aid on it, because I'm continuing the journey. I'm continuing the pursuit. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, shortly after this, we know the Last Supper. None of them understood. See, this is where I need to get... I hope I can impress this upon you. None of us understands the way we ought to understand. I don't care how much you think you understand. Here the twelve are sitting with Jesus at, the, at what we now call the Last Supper, at the Passover meal where Jesus is giving them the, the revelation of communion of the New Testament in His blood, the bread His body, the wine His blood. He's giving them this testimony. He's telling them, He's been telling them for some time, I am going to die. They are going to kill me. They heard it, but they didn't hear it. And they're sitting at this meal... And they're still having these discussions and debates as who's going to be the greatest, who should sit at his right hand and his left hand, you know, who's going to sit in, who's going to sit next to Jesus in the kingdom. Well, I think it should be, I think it should be me. You know, I'm holier than the rest of you people. Right? I mean, this was going on at that table. And then you had one getting ready to try to force Jesus to do something that he didn't want to do, that it wasn't time to do. So you had Judas with his agenda, getting ready to betray Jesus, I believe, not just for the 30 pieces of silver, because Judas didn't really... Everybody says it was for the money. It wasn't for the money. Why did he throw the money down when Jesus was... He saw Jesus wasn't going to fight it, or disappear, or fight the Romans and set up the kingdom right then. If it was about money, he'd have kept that money and went to Vegas or whatever. Right? No. What about the money? He was trying to force Jesus' hand. So you 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 got people trying to manipulate. You got people out there saying, "Who's going to be the greatest?" And then Jesus has to turn and look at look at Peter. Now listen to me. And this is Luke twenty two. You can read this for yourself. But Jesus turns and he looks at Peter and he says, "Satan has desired to have you." That he may sift you as wheat. Oh. Think about this. Here's a man that when Jesus wanted to go launch out into the deep and fish again, he didn't want to do it. Here's a man who's rebuking Jesus, say, You're not going to die, you're not going to cross, this ain't going to happen. Lord, you got this wrong. <laughs> right? Here's a man arguing with everybody who's going to be the greatest. 
I mean, if we looked at him and we were voting on who, who's going to preach, who's going to be the head apostle and preach the day of Pentecost, we wouldn't have picked Peter. Because that's what we human beings do. Right? But you got this, you got this guy doing all this stuff. Right? But not only did God see Peter's potential and what Peter would do for him. Satan saw it. Satan saw this sheer determination in, a, in an individual who, yes, flawed, but loved Jesus and loved the Word of God and loved the truth above all else. See, this, this is it, folks. This, this, is, this is what it boils down to. If you love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love the truth, you love the Word of God, and you're gonna, you've made up your mind, you're pursuing that. No matter what comes your way, even if you fail, even if you fail yourself, you've made up your mind, I'm getting up. And Jesus will clean me off. And I will fulfill my destiny and my calling and my purpose. See, Satan saw it. Satan has desired to have you, Peter. Now, Peter should have paused for a moment and remembered the story of Job. And had he paused and remembered the story of Job, he might have fallen on his knees and really prayed for a while. Because whenever Satan desires to have you and God permits it for a season, things about to get rough. Right? Satan has desired to have you, he said to Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not and when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Now think about those statements. Satan's going to have you, Peter. I'm going to let him tempt you, test you. You're going to see your weakness. See, listen folks, all God has to do is pull his hand back for a second and let Satan work with what's already in us. And we'll crumble like a house of cards in a whirlwind. You hear me? God pulls back His hand of grace. Then I'm talking about the grace that gives you the strength and ability to walk with God and obey God and live for God. God pulls His hand back and lets Satan come in to test you or sift you or to try you. You will fold up like a house of cards in a tornado. How many of you know you've seen yourself be strong one minute and crumble the next? This is the reality of our battle. Never think for one minute that you are strong and you got it all together. You are nothing apart from the grace and the power of God and the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost helping sustain you and give you the ability to walk this thing out. Now you have to want to, but you cannot do it without Him. And there will be times that He steps back and lets Satan come in like a flood to remind you you are nothing. Do you hear me? You are nothing. You are no better than anyone else. The only thing that makes you special is because God Almighty loves you and wants you. Think about that. See, that's why there's no place for racism. There's no place for people who have money looking down on people who don't have money. There's no place for all this stuff because no one is anything. Apart from the grace and power of Jesus Christ. And even if you have the grace and power of Jesus Christ, it doesn't make you better than somebody else. 
Because guess what? You got the same sin disease that the unsaved person's got. You just got somebody helping you and washing you and forgiving you. The same one they need. I like what some people have said. I'm not better than you. I'm just the beggar who found who had the bread. You need to find who's got the bread of life. Or who is the bread of life. Yeah. Because we've got to continually eat that bread. And drink that cup. And it's not about taking communion every day. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the Jesus, the bread of life. The wine of His blood. The wine of His Spirit. You see what I'm saying? He said continually partake. Continually. Continually. What are you saying? You'll never have a time. You will never, ever have a time you don't need Me. That's what Jesus is saying. You'll never have a time you don't need My strength, My grace, My forgiveness, My power. You just got to stay. You got to stay humble. You got to confess when you sin. you got to make up your mind that you're going to do your best to walk away from it. That you are going to follow after Him. That you're going to do what you need to do chasing after Him. That you're going to be like Peter and love Him. Now see, here's what happened to Peter. Everybody knows this story. What's he say to Jesus? I'll never deny you. No, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before morning. How would you like to get that prophecy? First of all, here's a, here's a prophetic word for you. Satan's desired to have you. And you're going to fall because when he says you'll be converted, that means you fall. Satan's desired to have you. He's requested to have you. You're going to fall, but when you come back, you'll strengthen your brethren. Right? Oh no, Jesus, I'm not going to fall. No, Je listen, if Jesus says you are, guess what? You are. <laughs> right? Somebody would say that that was a false prophecy. That wasn't a New Testament gift of prophecy working. Because it didn't edify and exhort and encourage. I'm just picking right now. But what does he say? He said, I've desired, he said, Satan's desire to have you. He may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. Peter's like, Lord, I'm not going to deny you. Yes, you will. Three times before the morning. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane. The soldiers show up. Now, hear me what I'm about to say. Peter meant what he said. I'm not going to deny you. I, he even said, I will fight to the death for you. Why do you think the only one of the twelve that pulled his sword out to fight the soldiers? I mean, Peter didn't have a chance against all those Roman soldiers. He took out a sword and cut a man's ear off. Meaning he missed. Tried to hit his head, I guess. Here's a man willing to fight to the death. To save Jesus from... And I think this is what crumbled him when Jesus said, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. Let this happen. And Jesus picks the man's ear up and puts it back on. At that point, Peter runs out. Mark 14, I believe it is, says they all forsook him and fled. And then they follow him to where he's arrested. And I think they're thinking, you know, he escaped every other time. What? He'll just escape again. He'll disappear. Foosh. No, they saw. John, especially. John and Peter stood there and saw them start beating him. They knew. Why is he doing this? Why is he, why is he letting this happen? Listen, folks, this is always going to happen in your walk with it. Why is God allowing this to happen? Why are these bad things happening? People are asking this why now. Why is God, why is God allowing ISIS to behead Christians and kill children? 
Why is He allowed? A lot of people are questioning God. Why? And, and, their, and their questions are causing, are driving them away from God instead of to God. You think about what Peter did. I don't know Him. Cursed. And maybe it was out of confusion. Maybe it was out of fear. But he did. He denied Jesus and cursed. And Jesus is the one who said, if you deny me in front of men, I'll deny you. This is a serious offense. Right? A very serious offense. But again, he didn't catch God by surprise. And the Bible says, you'll read that on, you read it in Luke 22 and the other Gospels, you can read it. It says Peter went out and wept bitterly. You know why? A true born again Christian that loves Jesus with all their heart, when they sin, when they fail, when they blow it, it breaks their heart. They care about it. They care that they've blown it, that they screwed it up. I can tell you the one that's not really living for God and walking with God or may not even be born again is the one who can, who can sin, who can fall, who can mess it up and, and they, they, they make excuses. They justify. They, they try to reason it away. Oh, it's no big deal. No, the one who understands that sin is serious and the one who doesn't want to lose their relationship with Jesus and doesn't want to fall away and doesn't want to be deceived and doesn't want to be lost takes it seriously and they'll weep bitterly and they'll repent and they hate it. See, the difference between, the difference between a Christian that's going to make it and one that's not going to make it is the Christian who's not going to make it is the one who just says, you know what? I can pretty well do what I want. It's no big deal. God understands. He'll forgive me. Versus the one who realizes this can destroy me. This can take me away from God. This can hurt my relationship. This can cause me to miss eternity with Him. This is serious. I'm not going to let this happen to me. I'm not going to live in this. See, it's a big difference. You're going to live in it? Or are you going to hate it? See, I love the Scripture in Hebrews chapter 1. It talks about Jesus, how God anointed Him basically. He anointed Him with the oil of gladness above His fellows. And that tells you why. He says, you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity or sin. Can I say this? If you love Jesus with all your heart, you will hate anything that gets in your way. Anything that can harm that or take you away from it, you will hate it. Now you might trip over it, you might fall, you might, you might, you might do something you don't want to do. Remember the Apostle Paul said, there's things I don't want to do that I do. But I refuse to live in it. I refuse to stop right here. I refuse to make theological excuses. I refuse to get angry or bitter or stop my pursuit of God, of knowing God, knowing His Word. Amen? See, the lukewarm Christians, the backslidden Christians, the struggling Christians, the Christians that got it going on okay at the moment. Bottom line is, we're all fighting the same demons and the same devils and the same fleshly lust and fleshly sins. We're all fighting in living in this world and we're all fighting the same thing. The only thing that makes us different is what we, what we do with it. How we look at it. How we approach it. Do you make excuses to keep doing it? Do you get angry at God and frustrated at God because He let this happen? Or Some people, listen, I get the emails, I get the phone calls, I talk to people all over the place. A lot of people are angry at themselves.
they literally are angry and bitter at themselves because they they're like, I tried, but I failed. I tried, but I failed. I tried, but I failed. I tried, but I keep failing. And what I'm sad about is the people, the Christians, who said, I'm done trying. I can't do it. I can't live it. So I'm going to quit trying. Those are the ones in trouble, serious trouble. You can't quit. You can't give up. Let me read this passage. Everybody turn with me. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. He says here, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be, you be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. This says it all right here. Let us run the race. Keep running the race. Lay aside the weights. What are those things? Unforgiveness, frustration, confusion, doubt, fear. Lay aside these things. And the sin. The sin you struggle with. What is he, what is he talking about? The sin that easily besets us. What do you, what do you struggle with? Some people's anger. Some people's lust, some people's pride, some people it's doubt and unbelief or fear. And Jesus just said, lay it, lay it aside, set it aside. Set it aside. Keep running the race with patience. Now patience just means endurance. Keep running. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't draw back. There's going to be a lot of people who make it to the finish line that we thought never would make it. There's going to be a lot of people that we thought were surely going to make it. And they're not. Any of us can give up at any moment in time. Yes, sir? Yes, it does. No, first, Paul said, first, yeah, just go ahead and turn to that. First, first Corinthians 9, and this does, it's a, it's a parallel passage. As Paul said, it dovetails with this, and it's quite, it's actually quite, quite scary. And when you really look at what the words mean, this is what Paul said. Let's read it. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. He says, Know ye not, that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And then Paul starts speaking of himself. He says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I mean, you think about that. The word castaway there is a selgia in Greek. And it means to become a reprobate. It's the same word used in Romans 1 when he says, those who give themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, 
and to get into homosexuality and all other kinds of perversion. It says God will give them over to a reprobate mind. To become a reprobate is someone who is completely cast away, gone, thrown off, done. And Paul says that about himself. He said this is a race that we've got to run to win. That we've got to keep running. And see, this is, this is the good news. If you keep running after God, if you keep going to Him, again, in this race, if you fall down, you get up. You don't quit and walk off the track. You hear me? You think about some of the races we've seen. Even in the Olympics, you've seen people in these races fall down and, and injure themselves even. And they'll get up and maybe limp and struggle, but they are determined they're going to finish the race. But if you walk off the track, if you leave the, 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 the race, then you, you fail. You're disqualified. You're cast aside. You become this castaway, this reprobate, this... And this is what Paul said. See, if we could just get this in to people, pursue Jesus, love Jesus with all your heart, love the Word of God, love the truth, never quit digging for the truth, never quit seeking for knowledge and wisdom and understanding, never quit going after God, worshiping God, praising God, thanking God, pressing in to know God more, pressing in to know His Word better, pressing in to, to live as, as godly and obedient Christian life as you can. But I don't care if you fall, if the devil trips you up, if you get beat down, if you get tempted, sifted, if you screw it up, like Solomon, like David, like Peter. You hear what I'm talking about? If you screw it up, just don't walk off the track. I don't care if you got to drag one leg, if you got to limp across the finish line, you get up and let the blood of Jesus cleanse you. Let God strengthen you and even in your weakness, cross the finish line and enter into heaven and be able to stand before God and say, you know what? I'm here because I didn't quit. And I'm here because the blood of Jesus washed me because I wouldn't quit. The blood of Jesus is not for the quitters. The blood of Jesus is for those who get in the race and stay in the race. Amen? Man, I'm going to tell you, back when my, when my darkness hit and everything blew up in my life and went downhill, I could have quit. I really almost did. I could have gone back to the drinking and the drugs and the sexual sin and all that stuff and died in sin and gone to hell. But I made up my mind. God, I may be, I may have a broken heart and a broken leg. I may be full of unforgiveness and bitterness and hatred and anger and confusion and in lust and, and strife and bitter, just, just eaten alive with everything. And the devil trying to torment me and destroy me. But I just kept saying, Jesus, I'm not turning loose of you. I turned loose of church for a little while. But everybody, I'm not saying you, you need to be in church. Do not forsake the assembling yourselves together as a matter of self. I was disobeying that scripture in Hebrews 10.25. I was disobeying that. But I turned loose of church for a while. I turned loose of Christians for a while. I turned loose of a lot of things that I really shouldn't have, but I did because I, was, I had all this stuff going on. But I'm going to tell you, I had, I had at the time, married women trying to have affairs with me left and right. I mean, hotly pursuing an affair. I mean, they were married. I was going through divorce. I mean, I could, I could name three, right? Three of them. That in any moment, if I'd have said yes, they'd have cheated on their husbands. I could have went down that road. But I remember when 
when those temptations came. I remember even though I was depressed and angry and confused, I remember one scripture that kept coming to mind. He that commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. I said, Lord, I don't want to lack understanding. I can be accused of a lot of things. You can call me a devil, but I don't want to be called stupid. Right? <laughs> and that was just me. I, I don't want to be called stupid by you. But I remember, I remember telling my dad about this. I said, it, you got to understand, when, you, when you've been divorced and, and, and you didn't do it, you didn't want the divorce and you've been left, you're lonely. You're depressed. You feel rejected. You feel lower than lower. And so as a man feeling like that, when you have several nice looking ladies wanting to spend quality time with you, if you know what I mean. That's, not, that's a temptation that's easy to just dive right on into. Some men do it. I thank God that I had enough sense to say, Lord, help me through this. Now, I didn't with everything. With that, I did. I went through that period. I've told y'all. I did slip up and start drinking some then. I did slip up and start hanging around people I shouldn't have hung, hung around. I got in some situations where I shouldn't have been. I was in danger. I was drifting. You get what I'm saying? But I refused to let go completely. And finally God dealt with me. And finally I just said, you know, and I think some of the, some of the drinking that I did was just because I was in so much pain. I just didn't want to feel it anymore. So I understand. And I don't beat people up. I mean, look, I just want you to make it. I know you may be going through a hard time. Some people fall to lust. Some people fall to sex. Some people fall to alcohol. Some people fall to drugs. Some people fall to, to you know, pity parties. They just live in darkness. Live in their own pity party world. And start hating everybody around. But here's the good news. I don't care what you're, how bad you're hurting. I don't care how far you've fallen. I don't care. You get up. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna stay there. Patrick, aren't you glad you didn't stay there? Yes, sir. Getting up is good, isn't it? Yes. The forgiveness of God is good. Kevin, all of us. I mean, we could tell our stories in this Christian walk. There's been plenty of times that it, it, it got difficult. It got miserable. There's a lot of people, you know. Paul and Marlene, you guys, gone through difficult times. It's easy to just give up. But the one that loves Jesus, that loves the Word of God, that's determined they want to be with God forever, just goes, I, I might have gotten knocked down. I might have let myself get beaten ahead. I might have been stupid and completely all my fault failed and blew it. I might have been hurt by other people, even a pastor, even a church, church people. But I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to walk away from Jesus. I'm not going to walk away from the Word of God. I'm not going to crucify Him afresh and put Him to an open shame. I'm not going to deny Him or be ashamed of Him or leave Him. I'm going to get up and I'm going to keep walking. And see, here's, this, this is going back to how I started this whole thing. Yes, there are people called to different ministries, different levels of leadership in the body of Christ, but we all are on the same level playing field of dealing with all of the, the devil and demons and our own flesh and mind and psyche. <coughs> Nobody's elite. That's why I just cringe when I hear them call the Pope Holy Father. Or His holiness. Oh, Jesus. If one of you called me His holiness, 
I would, which I know you would, but I just had to slap you. Some sense right into your head. What are you doing? No man or woman, human being, is his holiness. Not the Pope, not the Dalai Lama. They call him that too, by the way. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is no righteousness or goodness or holiness or purity apart from the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And unless that blood is on your life through faith and confession and walking with Him, unless that blood is upon your life, there is nothing good in you. I don't care how moral you are. I don't care how much you give to charity. I don't care how much you help people. I don't care how good you think you are. There is none righteous without the blood of Jesus Christ and the righteousness of Jesus Christ in them and upon them. And no one lives a sinless life. No one is His holiness or her holiness. No one is perfectly righteous. As, as Solomon said, there is no man that sinneth not. John, the Apostle John said it in John chapter, 1 John 1, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if, verse 9, we confess our sin, He, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then you do what? Take up your cross and follow Him. I love what He said daily. I believe that's in the Luke 13, Luke 14 when He's talking about it. And He says, daily. Take up your cross daily. Amen. Amen. Somebody say, forgiveness is good. The fact there's forgiveness with God. Can I read one more passage and let y'all? I'm going to read one more. This is the one I was going to start with and never got to it. Psalm 39. This is the last one. We close with this. I hope I'm communicating this the way I should. Psalm 39, are you there? Verse 4. This is, this is what we've tried to do today. This is for all those here, all those listening, all those who will listen. All the, especially all those that think they got it all together and they're better than others. Here's what he said. Psalm 39, verse 4. Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days and what it is that I may know how frail I am. Did y'all hear that? Lord, make me to know how frail I am. Help me understand that. Behold, Thou hast made my days as a hand breath, and my age is nothing before Thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in Thee. And look at verse 8. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. Well, this is a passage you really ought to look at and break down. Help me to know how frail I am. Help me understand. I am the house of card in a whirlwind unless God keeps the whirlwind from me. He said, man at his best state is altogether vanity. So we can't get into man worship because even the best of us are still vanity, emptiness.
And then he says, Every man walketh in a vain show. You know what that means? None of us. None of us in reality are what we appear to others. (laughs) He says, Lord, my hope, I just hope in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions and make me not the reproach of the foolish. See, humility, folks, humility is the key. I am frail. Even at my best, I'm still emptiness. God, you're the only thing that makes me anything. The fact that I am loved, the fact that you want me is what makes me something. And the fact that I'm willing to respond to that makes you happy. It doesn't make me better than somebody else. Amen? Hopefully this has helped you. You know, I get discouraged sometimes because I see a lot of, preach a lot. I see a lot of, do a lot of counseling, do a lot of preaching, do a lot of teaching. And sometimes you just don't see a lot of, you don't see a lot of uh, people changing their ways and getting saved and getting, getting, getting on the right path. It's easy to get, dis, you know, get discouraged sometimes. But then I have to remind myself, well, you know, they're, they're struggling with what they struggle with just like I struggle or anybody else struggles. So we all struggle. But I just have to remember something. God just says, preach the Word. Preach the truth. And I can't stress that enough how important it is to understand when I talk about loving Jesus, you can't love Jesus without loving the truth. The truth of God's Word. Sound doctrine. What is right in the Scripture. But if you love Jesus with all your heart and you love the Word of God and you refuse to let go, you refuse to give up and leave the race, you'll make it. And that's all I want. I want people to make it. I want people to make it to heaven. I want them to finish their, their race, to finish their course, I want you to do it. I want everybody that's ever heard me preach do it. And I hope they understand that I know they're not going to do it perfectly. They're going to fall down. They're going to sin. They're going to fail. They're going to get in the flesh sometimes. You know, the good thing about it, you know what? We, if we, we went outside, Patrick right there on, on the, the table outside and built a house of cards, the wind might come and blow it down. But you know the good thing is? We can build it again. See, that's for somebody. If everything, your house has come crumbling down, guess what? You and Jesus can build it again. Amen? You can always rebuild with Him. Now, without Him, you can try and the wind will come again. You get what I'm saying? There's hope. There's a lot of Christians out there that really have honestly bought into the lie that there's no hope because they can't overcome a certain thing in their life. No, there's hope. Some people have fought things for years. Maybe they fought it for five years and deliverance is coming on year six. Don't quit. Some folks have fought things for 20 years. Deliverance is coming on year 21. How many people have quit right before God was about to intervene? Alright? Don't quit. That's going to mean different things to different people this morning, but don't quit. Pursuing God, pursue God's Word, 
pursue Jesus, pursue righteousness, and all, pursue hearing His voice, pursue and desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit, pursue Him, and He'll help you make it. Give up though, leave, walk away. Here's the, here's the, the amazing thing, you can give up and walk away. He chases you. Some people, He doesn't give up on you easy. He'll chase you down. The Holy Spirit will chase you down and try to drag you back. But it's still up to you. He won't force you. Somebody say, God is good. God loves us. He wants us to make it. Can I say this to you? The race is fixed if you stay in it. <laughs> if you don't quit, you cannot lose. If you quit, you lose everything. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you this day. We praise you this day. We thank you that, Lord, there is forgiveness and mercy. That you... Lord, You are a patient, loving Father. We don't always understand Your ways and what You're doing at a certain time. We get confused. We get discouraged like Peter did. We find ourselves, Lord, denying You or doubting You or doing things we shouldn't do. But Lord, You are always the same and You are always willing to say, hey, get up. I'll clean you off. I'll help you keep walking. Lord, I pray that I know this morning that this message has been for somebody, for several people, Lord, for, for those listening by Blog Talk Radio, those who will listen to this, maybe listening now to a, the podcast or the archive session after this. Lord, we pray, God, that this message will give hope that You love people. You love everyone. You want everyone to make it to heaven, but there is only one way. They must confess their sins they must let the blood of Jesus wash them and cleanse them. They must have faith in the, in the death and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on that cross and His resurrection. And they must want to walk with Him and, and obey Him and follow Father, I pray, reveal the Gospel. Reveal that there is only forgiveness. There is only cleansing from sin. There is only the hope of eternal life through what Jesus did on the cross. And, and that people must find that and accept that and, and start walking in that. And that if they're believers and they've fallen down or they've fallen into some sin or into some habit that's, that's destructive and sinful and wicked in this world, God, that, that You will forgive them if they'll get up and leave it. If they'll get up and pursue You. If they'll get up and confess their sin and pursue You with all their heart. You'll wash it away. You'll give them another chance and another chance and another chance. You want us to make it, Lord. You want people to make it. You're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, you, you, you don't want anyone to die and go to hell. You don't want anyone to be separated from You. You want everyone, though, to change their mind, their, their emotions, their actions. You want everybody to change and to follow after Jesus with all their heart. To love You and to love Your Word the truth. The truth will set them free. God, make that real. The truth of Your Word, the truth of the blood of Jesus and following after Him will set us free from our failures and our sins. It will set us free from an eternity of damnation, Lord, of separation from You forever. That's the Gospel, Lord. I pray someone this morning, a believer or an unsaved person, will understand. They just need to get in the race and stay in the race. And they'll make it. Father, we thank You for that this morning. I'm going to ask you this morning. 
If there's anybody that says, you know what? I've fallen down in this race recently or I've been wanting to quit and leave the race. You need prayer this morning. I want you to step out and come up here. We'll pray with you before we leave. Anybody that needs prayer, I just want to give you that opportunity. Those of you listening by radio, be glad to pray with you. Talk with you, pray with you at a, at a later time. You can email me and we can we can talk and pray together. Father in heaven, I ask you just praying, Lord, that people understand this message, that it will touch their hearts, that they will continue in the race or get in the race pursuing after you, Jesus. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Did you learn something today? Did that speak to anybody about anything? Just raise your hand let me know if that spoke to you about something you needed. Amen. All right. Tonight, just letting you know, we're going to go ahead and log off uh, blog talk. We appreciate.